Getting the next generation on board with making stuff. Uh, and that is to say, um, creativity, experimentation, building things, and making them work. And so he started, he's going to talk to you about this, I think, but I started a, a, a program called Young Makers, uh, first in the Bay Area, and now it's spreading throughout the United States. So it's a great pleasure uh, to introduce Tony Durant. Mind reader, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, how many of you have uh, seen a Pixar movie? Good. All right. <laughs> I won't ask the opposite question. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is uh, three things: movies, math, and making. So the first part I want to tell you about how we make our films. Uh, just sort of an inside peek at uh, the movie making process, at least in Pixar. And with that as context, the second part of the talk, what I'd like to do is expose uh, a couple of the ways that mathematics is used in the production of our films. Uh, hopefully when you go to our films, you know, you get caught up in the story and, and you're not thinking much about the technology uh, behind the images that you're seeing. Uh, but there's a huge amount of, of math and science and physics that goes on behind the scenes. So this is, a, this is a chance for me to tell that part of the story. Uh, and the last part is, uh, uh, an initiative that I've been involved in for a couple of years now that uh, Tony mentioned. I'll see more about that when we get there. But let, let's jump into the movie making part. Uh, so movie production uh, begins with story. And uh, roughly speaking, we spend about four years putting a film together with about the first two years spent uh, really trying to craft a high quality story, interesting characters, interesting worlds. And the last two years is trying to uh, render that film uh, in you know, beautiful three-dimensional computer graphics. And the way the story team often operates is uh, through pictures. We're a visual storytelling studio. So uh, lots of pictures like this, uh, lots of sketches, uh, your storyboard panels. Uh, uh, in the old days, they actually used to be tapped up on cork boards as shown here. Uh, these days, we do it all with uh, digital video. Uh, but then the uh, story artists will pitch the, the story of the movie to each other, uh, refine it, uh, you know, throw in more, more jokes, try to find interesting arcs for the characters. And through the course of a film, you know, many of the storyboard panels are redrawn over and over again. In the, in the Monsters Incorporated era, we would maybe do 25,000 of these sketches as part of uh, creating the, the film. These days, we're up into about the 150,000 sketch range uh, with things like Photoshop and, and uh, Cintiqs and style. Uh, these storyboard panels, as I said, are put onto digital video, and then scratch sound, uh, temporary sound is added. And uh, that's done for the entire movie. So I'd like to show you a, a couple of short uh, clips uh, from uh, a film you might recognize uh, in story real form. So high tech. Audio here. The story is working well. You can watch the entire film in story reel form, and after the first minute or two, you forget that you're looking at sketches. You just get caught up into the story. So that's that's the stage that we want to get the story to before we start, you know, hiring uh, digital artists and, uh, and animators and so on. Uh, as the, the story starts to solidify, the the art department. Um, uh, gears up and starts uh, trying to develop character designs. Uh, here's some concept art uh, from Monsters Incorporated. Now, none of these sketches actually appear in the film, but it's important to do these sketches in order to, to discover the characters and uh, and what they look like. Uh, here is uh, here are a couple of sketches called uh, personality poses. Anybody recognize this character? <laughs> so the, the film is right today. Who's the character? Remy. Remy. This is Remy. And I think you can uh, see why these sketches are called personality poses. Uh, just from these two little uh, thumbnails, you can you know, start to get a sense of who this character is. He's pretty happy. Uh, he, he's an upbeat guy, you know, ready to go get him, just like you guys in here. Uh, and 
uh, the, the, these sketches also uh, come to play uh, later down the pipeline when the digital models start being created. Uh, the, the, the artists that are creating those digital models will refer back to these, these poses to make sure that the character that they're building can hit the, the shapes that the art department is interested in. Uh, here's another character, uh, Linguini from Ratatouille. And in addition to sketching, we do a lot of sculpture as well. So this is a, a personality pose in clay of Linguini, uh, another one. And again, these uh, are sometimes uh, used downstream uh, when the uh, digital artists you know, want to make sure that they're hitting the poses that the director is interested in. And in fact, sometimes we laser scan these sculptures to create a, a, a digital reference model that the artist can use uh, to put their handcrafted digital model next to. <coughs> uh, in addition to all the characters, the, the environments and the worlds that the uh, stories are taking place in have to be designed. So here's some concept art of the, of the reef environment uh, from Nemo. Uh, some more concept art from the kitchen in Ratatouille. And so you, you'll see we use all sorts of media in this, in, in concept art. We use pencil sketches, pastels, watercolors, Photoshop, photography, combinations of all of the above. Uh, sometimes we'll, we'll build little scale models. Uh, how many of you saw Up? The, the, the house in Up was built in miniature uh, to get a sense of the scale. Wish I had a picture of that. Uh, as the designs really start to solidify, then the, the, the digital artists, the, the digital model builders start uh, to get going. And in the, in the creation of a digital character, there are several stages that are very much akin to how you would go about building a physical marionette. So you know what a marionette is, a, a, a physical puppet that, that you can uh, bring to life by, by pulling strings around, uh, like, like the sound of music, for instance, if anybody remembers the sound of music. Or am I just, am I dating myself? <laughs> Uh, we just got back from Switzerland walking around through the high Alps and I kept singing the hills are alive and like, like <laughs> the kids are about ready to kill me uh, I won't do that for you here today uh, so one of the first stages in building our digital marionettes is uh, creating their, their basic shape the basic geometry which is akin to uh, sculpting the, the, the wood or the, the styrofoam uh, that you might uh, use if you're building a physical marionette. Uh, one of the next stages is to add virtual strings to the marionette, uh, akin to the physical strings that you'd add to a physical marionette. And for us, these virtual strings are, uh, are uh, controls that uh, can be used to, to affect the pose of different parts of the character. So some of these uh, controls are things like the degree to which the right elbow is bent. So there's a control that the animator can wiggle back and forth, and as they do that, the elbow bends. Other controls are the degree to which, say, the jaw is open. And so as the animator wiggles that back and forth, the character's jaw will open and close. Uh, some are really specific, like the degree to which the middle of the right eyebrow is raised. And all taken together, our characters uh, typically have about a thousand of these uh, digital strings, whereas a you know, physical marionette might have a dozen or maybe two dozen if it's a really complicated one. So our, our, our characters are extraordinarily complicated and can, um, uh, can really hit lots of, lots of interesting poses. Uh, for those of you that, uh, uh, of the thousand controls, we have about 300 just in the face. We obviously spend a lot of time working on facial animation because so much of the emotion of the characters is carried through their face. Uh, those of you that may, may know a little bit of physiology uh, may know that there are about 30 degrees of freedom in a human face, about 30 nerve bundles. We have about 300, so we're 10 times better than a human. <laughs> uh, here's a, uh, a little test of a, of a body rig. Uh, we call this process of creating these virtual strings rigging. Um, so the animator in this case is exercising uh, probably on the order of three or four hundred uh, of these controls uh, to bring this character to life. So 
our, our animators are, are just extraordinarily talented. So basically what we're giving them is a big black box that has values for these thousand different controls as input, and geometry comes out the, the, the other side, the, the posed character. And uh, their job is to determine how those variables change over time in order to get the character to act. And the, the animators don't think of themselves as creators of motion. They, they, they think of themselves as actors. They're just acting through these characters rather than through their own bodies. So rather than creating motion, they think of themselves as creating emotion. Uh, another stage in the character construction process is shading. This is akin to uh, spray painting your, your physical model. This is where uh, the, we tell the computer how the objects are going to respond to light when uh, illuminated by virtual light sources. And again, this is heavily directed from the art department. So here's a, uh, a, a sheet from the uh, model packet uh, for Sullivan in Monsters Incorporated indicating how, uh, how he should look, how, the, how his various surfaces should respond to light. Uh, this also has to be done for environments. So here's a shot from the Ratatouille kitchen. So every one of these pots had to be modeled and shaded. Uh, we don't do a lot of rigging for, for, for rigid objects like pots. Um, but next time you see one of our films, uh, wait until a, a fairly visually complicated part of the film and just step out of the film for a second and look around at the environment. And, uh, and, and, and notice how much stuff is, is in that image. So here's an example from the kitchen. Uh, all that stuff had to be placed. So there are artists that are going to place each one of those, those pots, uh, each one of those, uh, those uh, frying pans on top, um, all the little rivets and whatever that espresso looking machine back there is, I don't even know what it is. Uh, all that stuff had to be created and placed. Um, that's, a, that's called set dressing and it's, it's kind of an underappreciated part of the process. And then jump right back into the film so that you get carried away by the story. Uh, one of the last stages in the process is uh, lighting. And this occurs after the set dressing has been done to create the environment, the characters have been placed in the environment, the animators have, have made them move and uh, brought them to life. It's the lighting department's job to take, again, uh, uh, direction from the art department and the director and place virtual light sources in that environment so that when we do the simulation of how light is going to bounce around, or when the computer does the simulation of how light bounces around, uh, that the light coming back to the virtual camera after it bounces off all the virtual objects has the warmth and appeal that the director is after. So this is a, you know, a little bit of concept art to indicate what the director is after for this particular shot from the film. And uh, here's one of the final images that appeared in the film. And I think you can tell that you know, the artists, the lighting artists have done a pretty good job of uh, matching the intent. Uh, it, it, in the Monsters Incorporated era, uh, we would typically have 50 to 100 virtual light sources that are placed in the environment. Uh, so let's take, a, um, let's take that same set of shots that we saw earlier and uh, again, starting with the story reel form, let's follow those shots down the rest of the production pipeline. Uh, first into layout, where uh, the uh, very crude rendering, very crude drawing is done, uh, but the characters are placed in the environment with very crude animation. And then next animation is done, uh, and then crowd simulation, and then final render. Hopefully you'll be able to hear this. All right, so that's sort of real form. Here's the layout. It's really hard to watch the movie in layout form. Hey, 
that easy. So, <laughs> uh, so that's, that's, again, four years of work by lots and lots of people at different times. Uh, the editorial department, when you walk by their bay, you hear particular shots loop over and over and over again as they tweak the sound and the, and the way it's cut. And uh, that, that repetition, I think, is, is a lot of why the editors are a bit strange. But <laughs> I think you're starting to get a sense of that after hearing that, that loop you know, just four or five times. They, they listen to things looping 50, 60, 100 times. I don't know how they hear anything after that. OK, so with that as a backdrop, uh, I want to dive down a little bit and uh, just show you a few instances of where mathematics is used in the production of our films. Uh, but the meta point here is that uh, th I'm just point sampling here. This is just a few isolated examples. Pretty much anything you learn, uh, at least through sophomore level in college, in, in any math course, uh, except maybe for some uh, branches of abstract math, uh, we use all the time every day. So this stuff is this stuff is relevant and important. And part of the reason that I'm here is Pixar is really interested in getting this message out. Uh, so that you know, we can help to inspire uh, the next generation of mathematicians and scientists. Many of you sitting in this room, I'm sure. All right, so let's start with a really simple example. Uh, imagine this is Woody, and he's going to walk across the stage. Talk about the location of the square by talking about the x and y coordinates say, of the, the lower part. Uh, and when it played across, uh, the things were changing. In particular, uh, the x coordinate uh, lower left corner was uh, increasing by, uh, by an amount that uh, B is an amount T through uh, representing the distance that it from uh, the beginning to the end. So another way to say this is that the mathematics of translate addition, or it's a tradition. About scaling, what's the mathematics of scale? What the things about the coordinates that you scale? What's happening to the coordinates as you scale? The mathematics translation is addition, what's the mathematics of scaling? Multiplication, right. This coordinate is either increasing or decreasing on the scale factor, S, right? How about rotation? What's the mathematical notation? Uh, basic matrices. That's true. Um, that's true for all of the transformation matrices. We often use abbreviate, uh, more compact than we're doing. Uh, there's also trigonometry. So the mathematics of routine is probably not true. <laughs> uh, let's look at that a little mostly. So uh, here's a coordinate system. I want to rotate the thing by an angle theta of origin. Right? There's a little, little triangle here. Uh, and the horizontal direction, the x part of the angle is going to have length cosine theta, and the vertical part is going to have length sine theta. And there's a sine angle over here, y changes. And if you write out the equations, right, it takes about minutes to convince these equations, right? But you'll see that the, the x coordinate, the new y coordinate, related to the x and y coordinates uh, uh, through these trigonometric functions of sine and cosine. And uh, we made those two uh, equations uh, in one matrix equation. And we can compose these options, say you want to translate and then rotate, we can compose these operations by doing matrix application. So those simple examples are already bringing in a ton of linear algebra and trigonometry. And we get to stuff all the time every day. Now, those are a couple of instances of pretty old math. Um, you know, multiplication and addition have been around you know, thousands of years. Uh, trigonometry, you know, certainly hundreds of years. Uh, but next about uh, a mathematical topic uh, that was invented uh, about 20 years ago uh, to support the film industry. So not only are there old mathematics, there's a lot of new mathematics as well. And the problem that uh, this new mathematics subdivision surfaces uh, solves is how do we represent in a computer the complex shapes that you see in our films? So, for instance, uh, take this guy down here. Anybody know where this guy is? It's from Toy Story 2. Who's the character? Yeah, Big Al, Al McWiggin from uh, Howl's Way Mark. I think one of the best humans I've ever built. Um, you know, his face is a really complicated shape, his hands are really complicated shapes. And, and they move in a complicated way. Just look at your hand, right? Uh, and, you know, as your hand moves, there's all sorts of complicated stuff going on. And we somehow need to represent all that with moving geometry uh, compactly in a computer that you can write programs about. So how do we do that? Well, rather than talking about stress in three dimensions, let's drop down a dimension and talk about curves in the plane. And then we'll go back up to uh, just three dimensions. So if this is the, the shape that I want to represent, nice with S, uh, maybe the simplest thing I could do is uh, put in some little line segments here that approximate curve. And uh, we're after you know, creating the illusion of smoothness, which we can do if we make these pieces small enough. Right? So if, if on camera, you know, the S is far away, so the piece is really small, it's going to look pretty smooth. Uh, unfortunately, every time our director says, well, you know, the model's never going to hear about that on the screen. Uh, they lie. Uh, not intentionally, but uh, it's generally the case that, for creative reasons, 
they decide, you know what, the story would be a lot better if in this scene we get really close to that thing. So that's a problem for the approach because you just don't want small to make pieces. So uh, one way to solve that is by creating, by creating an approximation shape that really is smooth. So for instance, if I take a piece of circle and cover part of outline, and then take a, a, a different different circle and kind of stitch them together to hide where they, they join, then I get a nice smooth shape. And you can get as close as you want, and it's not gonna, it's not gonna break down faster. Uh, that can be done. I mean, it's kind of complicated to do that piecewise circular arc construction in, in the plane. It's even harder to do it for surface. Turns out spheres just aren't uh, spheres only curve away, and so you, you can't like, saddle point things if you're just using spheres. So you have to use more complicated shapes, and that'll be done in a simpler way. And uh, to describe it, I just had to tell you how to pinpoint. So uh, here's my segment AB. Can everybody imagine where the midpoint of that segment AB is? Yeah. So geometrically, it's going to be in the middle of the line segment, about there. And I can compute its coordinates if I know the coordinates of A and B. So here's the coordinates for A. Where the coordinates uh, increasing by, uh, by an amount. Uh, B is an amount B e through uh, representing the distance that I'm uh, beginning to the end. So another way to see this is that the mathematics of translation addition, the coordinates change addition. Scaling, what's the mathematics of scaling? What happens to the coordinates as you scale? What's happening to the coordinates as you scale? The mathematics of relation is addition, what's the mathematics of scaling? Multiplication, right. The x coordinate is either increasing or decreasing by the scale factor, S. Right. How about rotation? What's the mathematics of rotation? Uh, somebody said matrices. That's true. Um, that's true for all these coordinate transformation matrices. We often use to abbreviate uh, be more compact than the calculation doing. Um, there's also uh, yeah. I heard the average. Yeah. So uh, the x coordinate of m, for instance, is going to be the average of the average of a and b, y coordinate average of um, uh, a and b. So that way, I'm going to be even more terse than this. So a plus over two, that means the same thing to the y coordinates. Uh, geometrically, that splits. And now you know how to create smooth curves. All right, here we go. It's going to be interesting to do this while I talk. But uh, here's a uh, here's a quadrilateral. And it's going to be my job to uh, make a smooth curve out of this quadrilateral. And uh, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, compute midpoints, which we just want to do. Uh, so what I did is I, I took I put four points, I got eight points, but the uh, the eight points to the polygon that I have are no smoother than, than I started. So in the second half, I'm going to make it smoother. And I'm going to do that by putting the points around. In particular, I'm going to move this point uh, from where he's now to, uh, his, to the midpoint of his neighbor to the right. So look at this sec. This guy is going to move to here. This guy is going to move to here, and so on for the others. So again, that just involves computing midpoints. I'm going to call that averaging step. Okay, so eight points, and it looks more like an octagon sort of shape. Remember, my goal is to produce a smooth curve. So how does it curve? It's not smooth yet. Mm -hmm. right. Do it again. Yeah, so we split and average again. We split and average again. See what's happening? So uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, conceptually, I'm going to split an infinite number of times. And that'll get me in the limit of a nice smooth curve. And it's a, it's a true and surprising fact that that the smooth curve I get in, this, in the limit of this process turns out to be a piecewise parabola. So there's a little parabolic arc here, another little parabolic arc here, and those arcs naturally stitch together. So I'm getting a piecewise construction, but I don't have to work at it. I just have to do splitting and averaging, and the mathematics takes over for me. Now remember I said we had to create not just static geometry, but also animated geometry. So somehow I need to animate this smooth curve. So I'm not going to see this quadrilateral appear on screen. What you're going to see is an approximation to that limit curve. And I can make that limit curve dance just by animating the original four points. Right? Clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so let's, let's play with this idea a little bit. And uh, now let's use weighted averages. Uh, so if I want a point here that is uh, as uh, B with twice the influence of A. So that I, I want to take A, one copy, I want to take copies of B. And what do I have to divide by get a proper average? Right. Right, so I'm going to take, I'm going to call that a plus b over three. Geometrically, it's going to split curve, uh, split lines of it, uh, ratios two to one. Notice that even though the two is next to the b here, the two is opposite b in the, in the construction. Uh, what if I take a three-point average, a, b, and c? Um, so if I take a straight average, can you sort of imagine where the midpoint, where the straight average is going to be located on screen? 
Uh, oh, well, actually, I compute it by A plus B plus C divided by 3 if I get proper average. Uh, geometrically, it's going to be in the middle of the triangle. And middle here means that uh, these three sub areas are all going to be equal. I want to weight it out because I want to take B with twice as much weight as A or C. It's A plus 2B plus C divided by 4, your proper average. Geometrically, it's going to be twice as close to B as it is A and C. And what that means is that this area will be twice as big as these areas. So the area opposite B will be twice as big. Right. So there's a nice connection between these algebraic formulas, the geometry, and now by using this idea of splitting and averaging, uh, we can create some smooth curves. So you know this little box, notice this little box out here, this one comma one? That says that when I do the averaging, take the uh, two points of equal weight. It's going to get me the point. But I can now do a three point average with relative weights one, two, one. Uh, and that'll give me something else. So here's a split as I did before. Now when I average, I'm going to do an average of uh, weight average three points each time. So this guy, for instance, is going to move from where he is is two years to twice him plus one him plus one him. So that's going to point down here somewhere. So when I average with these weights, I get a shape like that. Split and average. Uh, I'm going to put those steps together to a compound operation I'll call subdivide. So subdivide is just means split and then average. So what's happening now is I'm getting um, a curve that uh, maybe it's a little bit smoother, and in fact it is smoother. That curve we had a minute ago had one, how many, how many of you get some populous derivatives? Tangent? So that piecewise parabola we saw earlier has uh, first order continuity, continuity of tangent line. Uh, this has continuity of two rings. Where in the second row we had piecewise parabolas, and now we've got piecewise cubics. And this is a little pieces of cubic polynomials that just, you don't even have to think about polynomials, they just stitch together nicely from this construction. Play with this a little more. So when I go with with one three three one, so this is a four point average. Subdivide with that, I get something that's even smoother. Got three derivatives of continuity. It's a piecewise grid. Anybody recognize the pattern that these numbers are coming from? One 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 two one one three three one. Pascal's triangle, right? So it, it's a remarkable fact that if you pick weights from a row of Pascal's triangle and run this process, you end up with piecewise polynomials with continuous derivatives. Uh, but you don't have to stick to Pascal's triangle. You can create other sequences. How about it? Why not? So what if I uh, do a weighted average with 1 minus 2, 3? So I'll split as before and use that averaging. Put that together. Right. So, uh, so Pascal's triangle is magic. If, if you pick Entries from Pascal's triangle, you get things that are smooth. If you don't pick things from Pascal's triangle, you get things that are no longer smooth. You get fractals. It can be animated too. So the simple process of splitting and averaging is really, really powerful. And really easy to implement. The, the analysis is a little harder, but the analysis brings in tools that you'll learn uh, probably by freshman, uh, freshman mathematics, uh, uh, linear algebra. It's a, a discipline called eigen analysis. And so if you know eigen analysis, you know enough to prove all these smoothness results. Next slide. And the nice thing is it all works for surfaces. So you take a faceted uh, surface three dimensions, run splitting and averaging, and if you pick your averaging weights just right, you can show that in the limit you get a smooth surface. And all you have to do to animate it is animate positions of those original vertices. So here, here's this, what, this one setting and averaging, one set of splitting and averaging. In addition to splitting the edges, you also have to split the faces. Right? But those are details. And so you can go from this shape to a flip object, uh, which is a smooth, um, nice smooth shape, works for arbitrary topologies as well. Uh, we started subdivision surfaces for a short film. Does anyone recognize the short film? <laughs> Uh, this is a character called Barry from Jerry Game uh, in 1998, just when we started using this stuff in films. Uh, and it's been used in the construction of all of our characters since then. Um, so all the, basically anything in our movie that deforms is being modeled uh, with this process of uh, subdivision. The true buildings were even modeled with subdivision, even though they don't form because it takes a very small amount of data. You just have to store those small amount of initial points. And then at render time, you can generate all these auxiliary points for the Make sense? Mm -hmm. piece. Okay. All right, so we'll finish up by talking about making. And uh, a little bit more about what I mean by making. But it, 
my interest in this uh, began from my, my personal experience at home with my kids. So let me tell you a little bit about the backstory. Uh, and it's resulted in uh, something like the Young Makers Program. And I'll give you a, a URL that you can go to sign up for the list and, and hopefully find something to get involved if, if you like to, to build this in the real world. Uh, so my kids, uh, I've got uh, Joseph who's now 18 and Sam who's now 18. And we all like to make things. We, you know, their legs were a huge thing in our house. But when the older one grew up, it wasn't much for him to graduate into. Right? What, what do you do to start building things? Well, so we started building things in the garage. And most of them went unfinished until uh, we discovered this event in San Mateo every year at the Maker Fair. Has anybody heard about Maker Fair? A few of you are great. So um, it's, a, it's a little bit like Buddy Fair, except instead of showing off you know, vegetables and livestock, uh, inventors and tinkers from uh, all over the place, uh, not just the Bay Area, uh, show up to San Mateo for a weekend and uh, bring their projects out to exhibit for the public. And this past Maker Fair in May had about 900 exhibitors and over 100,000 attendees over the course of the event. So it's, it's extremely popular and it's just become a, a, a big part of our family's life. Uh, and so we, we started a uh, kind of a, a family tradition where uh, it, before Christmas break, we pick a new project for ourselves and a new, a new design challenge. And we work nights and weekends until we exhibit at the fair. Uh, and then you know, the kids, you know, explain uh, the, the project to thousands of people. And in 2009, we were sitting at the dinner table and uh, wondered if we could make a, how many of you know, know about uh, uh, potato cannons? Yeah. <laughs> Characteristics that, uh, uh, whatever. Uh, so a potato cannon is a couple pieces of PVC that you glue together, <laughs> you run a piece of potato down the barrel and you squirt some hairspray in the back end for propellant. And you get a potato to go about 400 feet. Um, we wondered if we could up it a notch and make a Gatling gun version. That's <laughs> <laughs> what we came up with. <laughs> so uh, you can, it'll fire, it automatically fires, uh, it'll fire all six barrels in a quarter second. Uh, get launched, you know, six potatoes about 400 feet. Uh, great fun if you're a teenage boy, um, or a former teenage boy, <laughs> or anybody that likes to see things um, uh, blow up in a controlled fashion. <laughs> uh, so um, we took this to the fair, and you know, it was it was it, it was terrific. Um, a lot of media attention. You know, with, with that many people around, you know, there's going to be press. And um, at that point, we were hooked. And um, uh, you know, we wondered if there was a way to you know bring these kind of experiences to other other families. And you, you might look at it in you know, something like this, and you know, at first glance, maybe things pointless. Maybe even the second glance, you think it's pointless. Uh, but it involved uh, original design, uh, brought a lot of different disciplines together, uh, you know, uh, chemistry, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. Uh, electrical engineering was a transformer up there and some spark plugs to get it to, to fire. So it's just a you know, really fun post uh, opportunity. And then, you know, to have thousands of people enjoy it was really spectacular. So uh, we uh, got together with the folks that Maker Fair together in the Exploratorium to create the Young Makers program, and the idea is to bring this kind of experience to other other families. And the idea is pretty simple. Uh, we we you know we find kids who are interested in, in building things. Um, we ask them to come up with their own project ideas, and then we pair them with, with adult mentors and shop facilities, and then work with them for starting in January. Um, uh, meeting uh, regularly until the projects are ready to exhibit uh, at Maker Fair in May. Um, this past year we had about uh, 90 kids exhibiting, uh, 60 projects, uh, and um, we've helped to, it's organized around a club model, so we've helped to see uh, about 40 clubs, from mostly around the Bay Area, and as uh, Tony said earlier, uh, we're uh, going to expand beyond the Bay Area, uh, growing nationally. Uh, a couple clubs here in the Davis and Sacramento area already. Um, so if, you're, if you or your parent is interested in starting a club, um, go to the link I'll show you shortly and uh, we'll help you get going. Uh, here's some projects just to give you a sense of the, the incredible range of activities that the kid involved in. Um, and, and some of them, uh, some of the projects don't end up taking that long. So uh, these three girls, uh, we paired up with a mentor um, who also happens to be from Pixar. And uh, their project vision was to create a reconfigurable hamster habitat that doubles as a coffee table. <laughs> Why not? Uh, one of the girls 
uh, his mother is an interior designer, and, and she's been frustrated by the fact that pet habitats are often these, generally these you know, big, ugly metal things. And so this was intended to be an aesthetic, uh, an aesthetic one. And it, it only took a weekend to build. Uh, this is uh, this is Casey. Uh, uh, he built a uh, he, he took a, a remote remote controlled car. Uh, happens to be from one of our movies, but that's entirely coincidental. <laughs> uh, and he hacked into the control system of the car, instrumented it with uh, an Android phone, with a camera, uh, used the onboard uh, camera, uh, programmed it using an open source piece of software, vision software, so that, it, so that the RC car would follow circles. So here you see him uh, like a, a roll of tape. So as he moves the tape around, the car follows. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the ingenious piece of technology. So in addition to the programming, um, he, uh, he had to get the, so, so the, the, the software on the phone is locating the spot, which is the, the, the target in, in, in the center of the circle. That location is included in audio signal of the phone. You see that the audio cable coming down from the phone down here. It's decoded on board by an embedded processor. He hacked into the, uh, to the control system of the car. Uh, to get to, to drive around. So, you know, it may be pointless uh, on the surface, but it, it contains all of the elements that, you know, he'll need when he's designing uh, uh, physics sensors, for instance. Uh, we also work with schools a little bit. So if you have a, an adventure science teacher when you get home, ask them to their class into a makers program for a few months. Uh, this is Aaron from a school in Oakland. And, uh, this team built a custom electric guitar with LEDs on the uh, frets and the strings to light up to show which chords are being played. So you can bring in music, you can bring in art, you can bring in design, electronics, there's all sorts of, it, you bring whatever to bear is necessary to, to achieve your vision. Uh, just like in real life. Uh, this is Savannah, she wanted a music visualizer, so she learned about digital signal processing, she learned, learned how to burn, burn up a number of electrical components. <laughs> Ah, uh, that smell of IC burning. Mm -hmm. uh, but he worked with her, uh, her advisor, uh, learned how to read electrical schematics, uh, did simple audio filters uh, to create her project. Uh, this is uh, Joey. He's uh, from. He's a 13-year-old now from Arizona who found out about the, the program. Wanted to build a, um, a kind of a potato cannon-like thing, except it works with compressed air instead of hairspray, and instead of shooting potatoes, it shoots marshmallows. Uh, it'll shoot a marshmallow about 500 feet. And uh, that got the attention of the president. <laughs> uh, Joey was invited to the uh, science fair at the White House. And it was really great because most of the participants had traditional science projects with you know, posters. They were standing in front of their posters talking over pictures. And uh, Joey was doing a demo. You know, she um, uh, marshmallows into the executive dining room. <laughs> which had to us a little bit nervous, but so, so you remark, this is the happiest thing you've ever seen a president. <laughs> and I have to read. So I hope this gives you a sense of uh, you know, the, the range of possibilities, you know, whatever you're interested in, big, small, complicated, it doesn't matter. As long as it comes from you and you're interested in doing it, uh, we'd like to help you realize your vision. And uh, what I'd like to do is end with a project that uh, my family and four others just finished, which is not on the symbol end, it's on the end of the idea of uh, I showed this at Baker Ergo a couple of months ago. I'm Sam Rose. The past couple of years, we've been contributing projects to the Maker Fair, and every year they seem to get more and more elaborate. This year, we're building a flight center inspired by the TV show Battlestar Galactica. So we started out with a couple of Lego models for testing. Um, this was the first one we made as like a design prototype. Um, from there, we moved to a more complicated one. This is our motion test bed. Um, to make sure that others are going to be able to talk with the software um, and get the motion come on it. And then we moved to a CAD model. This is an Autodesk Inventor model. Um, and we used this as a more accurate um, design prototype, um, as well as to help us create other materials. And then we actually built it. He's dropped in the pilot with the same harness, and we can roll on two axes, this one and this one and 360 degrees both ways, and we use these two axes to simulate any flight sensation. In addition to recreating the feeling, of we're also trying to create a totally immersive experience by having joystick thrusters, instrument panel, three computer monitors that display the virtual world, 
a ton of additional set dressing and blinky lights, and audio and video clips between ourselves. So for the audio and visual elements, uh, we're using a variety of programs, such as Final Cut Express, Adobe uh, After Effects, the Photoshop, and GarageBand, to create any video pieces or sound effects needed play experience. So in addition to all the hardware, uh, the Viper project also requires software development, um, specifically the actual game that's going to be running on the panels within the, the cockpit, which is an open source flight simulator called Flight here. Um, and also all of the Arduinos that are controlling the internal set dressing and internal controls. Uh, we have to program for all of those. And uh, the blue code in Python that uh, communicates between the game and the controls uh, and the Arduinos. So if you want to get involved, uh, go to youngbankers.org, uh, sign up, you'll find a bunch of information there about how to club, uh, websites to go to for parts, uh, for project ideas. Um, if, if you run a club, there's also a link there, or if one of your parents does. Uh, we're just trying to get as many people involved in, um, in this kind of community as we can. And with that, uh, we have time for a couple of questions. <laughs> Did we? Did I bring the Viper with me today? Uh, it, no, unfortunately it's not terribly portable. Uh, we do have it up on jack stands and you need a flatbed trailer to get it you know, down to the fair. Um, but uh, if you go to viper.org, uh, you can keep track of us and where we're going to next. Uh, we have, oh, actually, we have a web event on Friday afternoon. Uh, the Maker Fair folks are running a virtual summer camp this year called Maker Camp. And uh, about 2 o'clock we're going to be streaming uh, some demos and some interviews. Right? Yeah. So that's one way to yeah. Was your um, potato gun in the Make Magazine? I was potato gun in the Make Magazine. Uh, no, uh, none of the projects we've built have been in the Make Magazine. They, they've just been a bit of a fair. But you can find lots of other fun projects in the Magazine. And there's also an online uh, website called uh, Make Projects. It has a lot of examples of uh, projects that other people have built and, and along with step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, we tried to put as many of the steps as we could in building a Viper on, on the web. Uh, it took eight months, uh, five families getting together, about a manner of effort. So it's not the project to start with. <laughs> We've been doing this eight or nine years now, so uh, lots of simpler projects to start with. There's also a uh, website called Instructables, which has, again, a ton of you know, great projects uh, to use uh, to, to look at these step step instructions. Did I ever meet Steve Jobs? Uh, yeah, I met him. Uh, I joined Pixar in 1996, and uh, he was actively involved in Pixar at that time. His activity went up and down depending on what other responsibilities were. But, yeah, great guy. What are you working on right now at Pixar? Oh, what am I working on now at Pixar? That's a great question. Uh, what I a, a lot of, so personally, um, my, my uh, personal expertise is, is mostly in geometry and in I think the, the sorts of things that you saw earlier with subdivision surfaces. Uh, but lately I switched to uh, human computer interaction and user interface design. So we've been working for the last couple of years on novel movie making interfaces, in particular using large format multi touch uh, monitors and connect cameras and things like that. The, the rest of my group is working on, uh, uh, a lot of them are working on simulation software to make, for instance, cloth, hair, water simulations run faster uh, and, and more um, more physically faithful. So in Brave, for instance, the main character, have you seen Brave? Or, or, the, the, the main character is, uh, is Merida, and she has a, a big hair of, a big head of flowing red hair that we uh, created a new simulator for. I think we should um, put 
because of the time, we should stop and uh, remember there's ice cream outside somewhere. But let's thank our speaker.